Good afternoon. This is Dave Crocker with uh, Terry Chauncey on uh, Warriors, Heart Chargers, and Patriots, connecting the little dots to the big dots. Um, uh, Terry is, um, besides being a dear friend of mine, is one of these people who taught me so much just on how he sort of educated me in the process of what was going on when I was the executive officer in George Washington. Um, he's one of the few people that will be in this this uh, on this podcast that have the breadth of of time and the breadth of experience across multiple commands that um, that 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 he had, and, and so he started out as a young E one, uh, finished up as a commander. Do I have that right, Terry? Yes, sir. All right. Now as a GS fifteen, I'm going to go through his his commands in just a moment, but I I really wanted to focus first on why um, why I think he's he, first of all why he was so critical to me. And, and you've heard me say this before, uh, there are people around you. If you don't know who they are, you got to go find them. Usually they'll go find you. Terry was a student up when he was the ship secretary uh, in George Washington to come find me. And he, he is sort of like, you know, I need to make sure that the XO does no harm here. I got to make sure that he's informed and that he then with the information he has, he can make the decisions he has to make. Um, he wasn't smart enough to identify Terry as, as a connector or a maven at the beginning, but it became quickly, it quickly came to me that, you know, people like this exist. And I'll always make this pitch back to anybody out there in business or corporate America or any services. They're all around you. There's the, there are these people who can help drive the social epidemic that allows you to reach critical mass on any topic. There are people around you who have this tremendous power of context because they're listening all the time. They're observing all the time across the breadth of the organization. Boeing could use uh, this type of concept right now in terms of uh, mavens and connectors. Uh, they basically are have their, 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 their little drumbeats going on across the command. They're talking to people at a variety of different meetings at various vertical levels. Uh, they're uh, making sure that the messages that are going out from the, the commanding officer, the executive officer, are, are clear and not misunderstood. Uh, the feedback comes back where we can either re-clarify or perhaps add more fidelity if that's what's required. And, and you don't get that unless people are willing to talk to you about it, right? And and and, and come forward and, and, and Terry was doing this uh, all the time. The, the other thing that 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 was so valuable is he, he became a, what I'll call a knowledge accumulator. Now there are people who accumulate knowledge and hoard it because they think it's some sort of a power gig. Um, Terry just chose to accumulate the knowledge and then put it in the right bucket. So when it added more information, more fidelity to the conversation we were having, it was there. And I knew it was authentic and I knew it was authoritative and it was really, really powerful. So um, I, I, I just, you know, and, and to this day we, we remain great friends because I, I've uh, still come to value some of the things that he's doing. I want to tell you just a bit about his uh, his long time in the in the Navy, and I may have some of the dates slightly off, but again, I have, I'm old, so I get some I get some uh, I get a little leeway here. Uh, so so Terry uh, joined the Navy, or I, he was a seaman recruit. That I think he joined uh, what 1980, 1981. Yes, sir, 1980. 1980. Went to recruit training command. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Spent six years on the USS San John C. Calhoun, which is uh, one of our ballistic missile submarines. Uh, he, had, he did something between there and, not, and and when he was on GW, but GW was the next big event for me, and I'm going to allow Terry to fill in wherever he wants to, but he was on George Washington with me from 91 to 93, uh, Director of Subman Submarine Manpower Requirements, the admin officer, which is another one of these you know Maven connector pieces on Theodore Roosevelt, USS Theodore Roosevelt, and another nuclear uh, air, uh, aircraft carrier from 2001 to 2003, chief of staff for commander of naval uh, uh, personnel, director of administration for the White House staff, correct? When you were in the White House? Yes, sir. Okay. So you, you're starting to get the picture, ladies and gentlemen. Promoted to a limited duty officer, which is, uh, you know, one of the most, uh, so he went from the most junior enlisted to the most senior, he, and he was promoted to LDO in 2013. Uh, Director of Manpower Requirements at NAVAIR, 
and he's now the director of fleet personnel programs at G at uh, as a GS 15 over at fleet forces command. So he is still spending eight and a half days a week trying to help young sailors and their spouses and the commands understand all the various programs because they are evolving so quickly. And along that line, I must tell you um, that I've had some premonitions about some things that I've never, that I didn't agree with. And I could always go back and I have gone back and Terry has helped me understand the process a little bit better, which sort of takes, you know, helps me stay out, you know, away from the cliff because sometimes I just don't know what we're doing, but, but Terry's involved in all of it. And the last piece before we get into the discussion, which speaks so much to a young man who has spent his life making deposits on behalf of the nation. And I don't think he's taken one. Uh, so I'm going back. So one of the, one of the things that I really want to talk about here that uh, that, I, that is important, uh, uh, it, it speaks to the breadth of his always making deposits on behalf of the nation and never uh, taking a withdrawal. He's not, he, he, he's always given to this country. Outside of all these other things he's doing and with this very busy job he has, he's a volunteer assistant fire chief and emergency medical services person up in Stafford County, which is where he has a home. He's a volunteer emergency medical technician in Chesapeake Beach, which is where he spends sort of is close to where he works. And of course, uh, Excelsior College would be so proud of all the all the things that uh, Terry's done. But but that, that, that's that's quite a quite a history, quite quite a record. So Terry, um, I don't. I, I think the way to start this, I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, you know what 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 compelled you to join the Navy? What what got you uh, uh, to the to the recruiting office? <laughs> you know, I ask myself that all the time. I honestly don't know. Um, I had a full a full scholarship to Florida State uh, in music. Um, music was always my, you know, what I wanted to grow up and be a band director. But uh, um, when I got into college, I guess I was disappointed. Music wasn't what what I envisioned it to be. Um, um, I took a part time job while in college in the auto parts, and the owner of the store um, made big promises uh, that I would go far selling auto parts. Uh, um, so I dropped out of college and did that. I thought it was going to be, and one day during lunch, I ended up in a Navy a Navy recruiter's office. Don't know why, don't know how. I just ended up sitting in front of a Navy recruiter um, and he was trying to talk me into going nuclear Navy. My scores were high enough to do that. Um, nuclear power scared me at the time. I'm, I'm from a small town, very small town in central Florida. I had one one red light kind of a kind of deal. Saw so small high school. Um, and nuclear power was not something that interested me. So um, he told me to pick, to pick a rate. The only rate that I saw that made sense to me was personnelman. Um, and because I picked personnelman because when I would go home and I told people what I did and I said the word personnelman, they could understand what it was that I did. Um, mm -hmm. So I joined the Navy to be a personnelman. So that's, that's where I got there. So you had no, but but before you joined the Navy, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? I mean, was or was, it, or was the Navy the sort of like I'll, I'll call it a default means by which for which you go out and try to figure out what you wanted to do? With your life? <laughs> no, sir. In fact, uh, when I uh, went home and told my parents that I had joined the Navy, my dad said, "Son, they're, they're going to uh, they're going to kick you out." in six months because <laughs> with your smart ass attitude, they're not gonna put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, boy, was he wrong. I, I, I mean, that, that's just, uh, you yeah, know, no disrespect to your dad, but wow. So you went to boot camp. Uh, I've asked this question of everybody that is that, that has been to boot camp, and I'll ask you, what, what, what changed about Terry Chauncey from the day you entered boot camp to the day you got out? When I was I was raised uh, to have respect. Um, so the yes sir, no sir, um, thank you, please was ingrained uh, in me uh, from childhood. So um, that wasn't hard. Um, the physical fitness piece of it 
wasn't hard. Um, the mind game piece of it was a, was a bit hard, um, but um, I guess the the camaraderie that I picked up in boot camp um, was something that that I liked. I had had it in band, um, you know, marching band, concert band, um, and it was something that I did not have after I graduated from high school. So something that kind of pulled me, I think, uh, into the Navy that, that really, that really, um, that I liked and it pulled me into, into enjoying what I did. And, and, and that was the camaraderie. So, so you get out there and you go to your first ship, did this, uh, did the ship or, or, or boat, did the boat reinforce those principles to you? Did you, uh, let me go back for, I mean, I want to ask this question. So before you left someplace, either at the recruiting office or maybe and or during your time at the, at the boot camp, you took the oath of enlistment, you know, and you raised your right hand, you swore an oath to the to constitution, you uh, to swear and support and defend the constitution of the United States and, and, all, and all the things that go with that. Did, did, did it, Sink in as to what to, in your mind and as to what you were actually doing when you raised that hand and, and swore that oath to the, to to the ideals that make this country great. Did that did, did did that mean anything to you when you first took the oath? It did because my my parents uh, are very are my parents and especially my grandparents are real big on the flag. Uh, my grandfather would go out every morning uh, and hang the flag on his porch. And the, and the thing he did every night before dinner was to pull it, up, put it up, and 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 put it inside the house. He never, he never kept the flag outside at night because it wasn't lit. And it was something that um, I was raised to respect the flag uh, and to honor the flag and to, and to honor the nation. So when I raised my hand, it brought me back to a time that my aunt um, was a was a police officer in my hometown. Uh, and I was there when she raised her hand and took the oath uh, when she was hired, hired as a police officer. So that it kind of drove home that that memory of my aunt uh, when she raised her hand uh, to be a police officer. Well, yeah, that, that's how lucky you really, because you, you gave you a step up and you knew what to look for and listen for to. Most people will say to me, I didn't really recognize or realize the the solemnity of the oath until five, 10 years into their, um, into their uh, uh, tours in the Navy because they didn't have that type of background. So thank God you had a great family structure in, in that regard. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I, 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 I asked the question too, because I, I've been to a couple of enlistments where, or re-enlistments where you uh, gave the oath and you were one of the people at that time, not everybody, would memorize it. They would use these stupid little index cards that drove me crazy, you know, and, but that was not Terry Chauncey. And, 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 and it was one of those things that I made sure that I picked up on as well, because it's all about eye contact. It's all about making pauses in the right, at the right time and maybe having the discussion about how that relates to honor, courage, and commitment, which of course are our core values. And I think one of the strengths of the Navy is that our core values directly relate back to that oath. Um, and and I, I think, you know, you, could speak to that uh, maybe when, when, as we go on here. You got to George Washington in 1991. Did you get there before I did? You did, didn't you? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Captain Balcom was there when I got there. Yeah, yeah. That, Captain Balcom, and then comes on this moron, uh, you know, who comes on and uh, and uh, and I I come in. I probably look like a god dang, uh, you know, like one of these soccer scrums where there's dust running everywhere and. Uh, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hellacious uh, type of things going on. Um, what was your? I, and I, I, I'm, all, I'm asking this because I've just I've never asked this question of you, you know. So because you know Terry and I, or, or, or Mr. Uh, Captain Malcolm and I, we we were completely different personalities, you know. And uh, and I and I love uh, Captain. Well, I followed him a couple times in in command tour, so I I uh, I I have so much respect for him. But when you saw this. Uh, bundle of uh, indirected energy go coming on board. What what was your thought? What what, what, were, you, what were you thinking? What uh, what, we, what were you going to have to do to fix this? I, I would say I was thinking, what would I have to do to fix this? 
I was trying to figure out what can I do to bottle your energy that I could share it across <laughs> the other departments because your energy level was, was so driving. Um, the way that you interacted with the crew and the wardroom and especially the cheese mess um, was um, I had never seen before. And, you know, in the jobs that I had had before I got my commission um, and you have to, you have to realize George Washington was my first ship as an officer. Okay. You know, um, my, my first ship was Mount Baker yeah. and that was a, you know, an old ammunition ship. Okay. Didn't have air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and as a young E1, E2, E3, and frocked E4, the officers on that ship were kind of standoffish. You know, you really didn't get a chance to really know them. And I was, I was, for lack of a better term, the XO's yeoman, although I was a personnelman. Um, the leadership, although I, I guess it was good leadership. Uh, it was nothing like what I had on the submarines. Right. You know, there's only, there's only really three admin types on the submarines. So you really get to know, you know, the skipper and the XO pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I, I felt very comfortable around, you know, the triad um, and a crew of 135 where you really get to know the whole crew's first, middle, last name, and probably three quarters of the crew's social security numbers. And then I get commissioned and put on an aircraft carrier of a, of a crew of, you know, 4,000 crew and then another 3,000 air wing. And then you come on board and it's like, wow. Um, just to watch your interaction with the crew. Um, I, one thing, you was never late to a meeting. And if oh, you were proper time, Terry, I always people on the Vincent always learned that they need to be there. Ten, <laughs> they, I conditioned them to be there ten minutes ahead of time. Well, uh, I, sir, I can never figure out <laughs> how you could be on time to a meeting yet still not pass a sailor in a passageway and stop and talk to them and get to know them yet be on time to a meeting because. You knew every sailor, you knew most of how they were feeling and what they were saying. You walk into the eight o'clock report and look at the RO or the Chang and say, hey, you know, did you know that Petty Officer so-and-so is having a problem with this? And then, of course, the department head, whoever will be the OPSO or RO, would look at you and go, no. And you say, yeah, you need to go take care of that because this, this, this sailor is having a problem. And you had just left him. But yet, but you were just left another meeting. I, I can never figure out how, how you could leave one meeting and get to another meeting on time, but yet have talked to 15 sailors between that last meeting. And it, okay. it's, like, it's like you had this magic skill to get between the meetings and still talk to the sailors. I never figured it out. I, I, I enjoyed, I, you know, Terry, you and I both enjoy talking to young men and women, and we love them to death for sure. Uh, thank you for that. But I, I so enjoyed this. And I want, the reason I asked the question was not for, you know, uh, um, self aggrandizement. I really wanted to come back to why, how I was able to do the things I was able to do. And that was because I'd get, um, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven, sometimes depending on what we were doing, phone calls from you every day or we, you'd stop down or if I came up to see what's going on with the captain, you know, we maybe even go behind closed doors once in a while and just have a dialogue about what I need to know from your perspective. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, what you did is sort of plug some of the holes in the leaky bucket for me because the information was going to get away if, you know, you didn't provide the right context for me. It's the power of context that I was talking about. And um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I had a chief when I, a senior chief when I was in HS seventeen. My first, uh, my my first command, or actually, I had a senior chief in HS fifteen. My first command as a JO, who always talked, told me to go look for the the wizards, the the experts, the people who had context. And I never really knew what he meant until later on in life, and really probably 
uh, it really hit home with with you certainly when when we were on GW together, and I, I I learned always to use the captain's office because of our relationship. I mean, when John Ottery and I joined uh, teams up in Carl Vinson days, we 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 picked up on the same piece. So, um, it, and I suspect that you did the same thing when you're on Theodore Roosevelt. And, and I would lo love to have you talk about the Roosevelt, although we know she's only the second or third best uh, carrier in, in the Navy, but um, what what changed for you? All right, so we, so, well, or let's not leave GW until, unless you're ready to leave GW. Were there other things that, that happened there that, you know, I remember us doing um, carrier group four when we had to do readiness for getting ready to go on our first deployment. I think you were still there then. And uh, we had some challenges, and uh, again, you were you were had your eyes and ears in with Carrier Group Four. You had your eyes and ears in with the other evaluators, uh, and uh, and you know, and you were there for the D-Day experience that we had when we went to Portsmouth, England. Um, talk about that one for a moment, Terry. So, for so, let me give context before Terry talks about this. We had the president, and his wife, and two hundred and eighty-five of their closest friends on board George Washington for the 50th D-Day anniversary. And I think there was 12 or 12 to 20 uh, survivors of D-Day that rode over with us. And whenever Terry had to get ready for a VIP tour, we would put out a notice, I think it was called a 50-50 notice. And it would be seven or eight pages. It gave a little bit of a tour and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, schedule and so everyone can follow. Well, when you have the president, and 285 is closest friend. You have a 50-50 and Secret Service, by the way, that is 90 pages long. Because if you were a Democrat, you had to have your own tour group. If you're a Republican, you had to have your own tour group. You know, and on and on and on. Talk to me about that experience for you. <laughs> well, we had set up um, the captain's uh, import cabin for the president. So we had gone out and um, acquired special furniture um, because what we had gotten, you know, GW had just been commissioned. Yeah. So we had pretty much Smart One's, you know, Mod Zero shipyard furniture in there um, um, in the captain's import cabin. So, um, and it wasn't it wasn't presidential. So we had gone out and spent quite a bit of money. We'd gone to Mount Vernon and got the ladies of Mount Vernon to donate a couple of authentic, um, you know, George Washington's uh, Queen Anne chairs, you know, to put in there. We bought some, some nice stereo and stuff and put it in there. And then the day before the president walks on board, secret service comes on board and says, he can't stay here. And I remember you walking in and uh, me telling you the president can't stay here. Well, we had, we had done or coordinated the stateroom assignments based on the president staying in the captain's import cabin. And um, the political um, fallout on where everybody sleeps close to the president is so, so great um, and I'm talking, it's almost, it's almost in inches. Um, who gets to sleep closer to the president? So when we moved, we had to move him in, inside the ballistic bulkhead of the ship. The captain's import cabin is outside the ballistic bulkhead of the ship. So we had to move the president and the first lady into the, um, the admiral's, uh, admiral's cabin and the first lady went into the chief of staff's cabin. Well, that put the president in a different location so we ended up um, having to measure, me and you had to measure where every stateroom was and move every cabinet secretary or senator or congressman around, which meant we had to move, we had to fly off more of the air wing than we had planned to fly off. We and we the, whole every, off, I think. the whole air wing. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we, had to, we had to reassign everybody else, you know, the cabinets, you know, the the, the 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 secretary of treasury was upset, or I forgot exactly which which secretary was upset, because some other secretary got to sleep, 
you know, 15 feet closer to the president and all kinds of stuff. It just, the way you had, you'd come in my state, you'd come in my office and just shut the door. And this is the old, uh, the old skiff type closet that yeah. I, my office was in yeah. and just, just start cussing. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was hilarious. And then at the end, um, some of the, um, some of the cabinet members uh, wanted to take some of the gifts home with them you know the, some of the yep. gw robes and stuff yep. and it, it just got to be so so disorganized you finally just said here terry take this figure out what we're going to do and just handle this so i got with us up oh, we just decided we'll just build them for whatever they yep. take because we yep. know what, what rooms they're in yep. that's what we did i, I worked with dd myers because yep. dd was on board yep. and we just built it, it was yep. just it was exciting to have them on board but boy, is it a pain in the butt to get it, to get everything. I'm going to spend about enough. I'm going to spend about an hour just on the D-Day thing on a separate thing, because matter of fact, maybe I'll ask you to come back on, because there were so many interesting things that happened on that, that uh, people ought to know. There were a lot of valuable lessons learned. Um, and, uh, and I actually saw President Clinton in, at his best in the way he communicated with young kids. He connected is better than any president I've ever seen in action. So, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, I'll see if you're available when I when I get ready to do that. Um, so I, I'm going to jump a little bit here uh, in the interest of time. I, you 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 had a lot of your CMP job, all of those. If you want to come back, please tell me you want to come back. But I would like to go to your White House tour because for me that indicate. I mean, that's not an easy job to get. How is it that Terry Chauncey came off of uh, Theodore Roosevelt and got selected to to have this really important job as director of administration of the military staff at the White House? I don't know if I'd say right place at the wrong time or wrong place at the right time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, you know, I was that's I I was when they got chosen for that job. Um, I was the chief of staff for um, the EA and chief of staff for um, Admiral Hoeing. He was CNP. Um, I don't know. I, I guess just got chosen for it. It was actually a pretty neat job. Um, it I think it killed my career because um, I was outside my yeah. my um, designator. But um, what what I learned was. Um, the president puts his or her pants on just like the rest of us do. They have the, they have the same concerns, um, than we do. Mm -hmm. Um, I learned that a lot of times they are disconnected from the real world, um, because they, um, they aren't allowed to know, um, a lot of things that you and I know. Um, just because they can't, they can't make a decision based on something that they might have heard in the news, which you and I both know half the news they hear is probably wrong. Right. At least half the news we hear is probably wrong. Um, so they're very, what they hear is very filtered. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of what they, what they hear is, picking people on their staff um, that can be discreet and feed them information that they may not hear in the, um, in the situation room, so to speak. So I, I gotta be careful what I say, but sure. um, you know, I had a, I had a nice, a nice tour there. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example of something that, um, that happened that really never made it to the news much. I got a call one day from, from the switchboard and they said, uh, she goes, I've got somebody on the phone here that says that the president met her son. Um, um, and he promised, this is a, this is president George W. Bush, Bush 43, the, the younger Bush, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, in Texas. And, and said that when he was able to run again, that he wanted to run with him. He, the, you know, Bush, the President Bush was an avid runner back then. Mm -hmm. um, and her son was an avid runner, uh, but he had gotten injured uh, overseas in, in Iraq. 
Um, and the president met him in Texas in a hospital and said he would run with him. And her son, her son was now able to run, and he, he wanted to cash, he wanted to cash in to run with the president. So I said, okay, um, let me uh, let me check. So, uh, well, what injuries did your son have? So she said, um, um, he uh, he had both of his legs blown off. Hmm. And I'm like, uh, here comes a, here here comes another joke. And a jokester, you know, calling in to try to play a joke on the president. And I said, I said, he had both of his legs blown off. Yes. And he's going to run with the president. She says, yes. Okay. Um, what was his name? And she told me. I said, okay, well, give me your name and number, and I'll check with the president and call you back. She said, thank you. So that evening... You know, um, you know, we had, you know, towards the towards the end of the day, you know, just just like we did, you know, for for you admirals, we have end of day sync. Mm -hmm. Something I started when I was there because it's something I'm used to. Yeah, they didn't do it before I got there. So at end of the day sync with the president, we did a round round table, and it got to me. So I said, Mr. President, um, I had an interesting phone call today from a lady who says that uh, you met her son in Texas, in the Texas hospital, uh, and you promised that um, when he's able to run again, that you would run with him. And he goes, really? And I said, yes, sir, he's an army vet. Um, and you met him uh, in the hospital there, uh, and he's a runner. And present, kind of in the air, and he goes, yeah, Sergeant Christian Baggy. <laughs> And I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> that's right. He goes, he's running again? And I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, schedule it, make it happen. Wow. So I scheduled it and made it happen. <laughs> Isn't that cool, so, though? Yeah, so Sergeant Baggy and his wife and his mother came to the White House, and the president ran with him. But Terry, it's emotional. I can feel it in your voice even because, you know, you were able to facilitate this and you were at the right place at the right time as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that, is a phone, that is a phone call that you wanted to take, right? You wanted mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And uh, I'm sure, I, I think it'd be tears running down my eyes uh, knowing uh, what little I know about the president and then uh, I, but I know he is one of those people that loved his uh, his soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to death. So uh, I, I think that makes that tour worth it right there. I, I, it, I don't think it was a career killer for you in the context of, where, because I think that you were still figuring out who you were. I don't not necessarily know what greatness was going to be later, but right at that moment, you were great. Mm -hmm. And don't, Listen, congrats! Uh, you were great right there. You hit the goal line. A lot of people don't hit the goal line that early in life. I'm still looking for that goal line, but that that's a that's a great moment, and uh, uh, it's a story that uh, is worth telling whenever you get the chance to tell it because people need to understand that uh, you don't have to be the president or uh, a four star admiral to make wonderful things happen. You made them happen on GW and, and all these other ships that you were on because I could I I. Again, I go back to just watching you uh, make life easy for people like the captain and me on, on, on George Washington. I suspect the same went for the captain and the XO on Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, so you retired in what year, Terry? Uh, 13. 13. And that's right. And so you were LDO when you retired. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the manpower requirements job at Nav Air, was that a civilian job or were you still in the Navy for that job? I was still Navy. Okay. So oh, no, 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 no. I was, I was a civilian. Okay. All right. So for those that are listening to this, a lot about manpower and requirements in Terry's life. Um, a, a lot. And, and that's why what he's doing now in the fleet personnel programs. I would suggest to you all that um, there's nobody. Terry might not have said no, but there's probably very few people that know more about the makeup of the American sailor and the challenges that they're facing and the challenges that their families are facing than Terry Johnson. 
um, uh, that, that I, you know, I've interacted with Terry on this a couple times. Um, and uh, I'm just hoping, I mean, you're looking for a great admiral right now, uh, but they're, you know, and you got a chain of command to follow and, and I know you respect the chain of command, but I, I, I think you're an authoritative figure in this regard. And I hope, uh, I hope people are paying attention to what you're saying because we still love our sailors and, and their families. Any thoughts on uh, the changes that are going on? I don't want to get into all the stuff that people are trying to make political fodder about. I'm talking about, um, are sailors still sailors? Do they still believe in the oath? Uh, are, are families uh, pretty much content? I mean, just in a general context, any any observations you, you want to make? Um, I think the sailors are still sailors, they're good sailors um, that are in the Navy. Um, I think the challenge we're having right now is recruiting. Um, and I think the area that we're really having the problem is not so much the, the kids. I think it's the parents. Um, mm. I th where we're not, mm. um, where we're not really hitting the recruitment button is on the parents. And I think where we're, we're going to start seeing a lot of the recruiting um, messaging now is towards the parents to show that we're really not, you know, we're not a bad, we're, we're not a bad employer. Um, where, where the feedback we're getting is the pullout of Afghanistan mm -hmm. and how we botched that up. Um, I think the parents are, are afraid if, if they're, you know, young, you know, son or daughter joins that that's going to happen again. And so we're, what we're having to do now is show them that that's not, that's not who we are. So we're trying hard to, um, to show them, um, as an example, um, how good our sailors are doing on the ships in the red city. Um, and how many of the drones were shooting down and how good we are at shooting those drones down both in the air and the, and the, you know, the surface ship drones that are, that are coming at us. So we're, we're really trying hard now to, to push that picture of how well-trained our sailors are to be able to catch that. That's a brand new warfare. You know, this is, this is hot off the shelf. So, yeah. so that's, I think that's where, where Admiral Cottle and Admiral Pavaro are, are really um, trying to show now the the professionalism of our sailors and how good they are at doing that mission set. Um, I have two observations I want to share with you, and you can tell me whether I'm on the mark or off the mark. Or, or, and one has to do with the retention piece. I think that it's tough. I, I agree with the parents piece, by the way. One of my favorite commercials of all uh, during the year is when they have the uh, parents talking to their kids during the army, right at the arm, prior to the army Navy game. And they're saying, are you sure you want to do this? And there's a dialogue going on between the young person and the parent. And uh, I think those are just powerful advertisements. But I, I, I think that one of the problems is that uh, the young people today, and maybe their parents too, are looking at this risk that this young man or woman are going to take, this oath that they're going to swear an allegiance to an ideal where the ideal is being tested right now by all of the stuff that's going on in this country. And so their, their mindset is, my, you're asking my son or daughter to put a huge deposit, of, and, and us as parents, a, a personal deposit into the country, yet there's a bunch of people out there that are just withdrawing like crazy who have never made a deposit into the country. Uh, uh, that's my biggest concern, and I don't even know how to how to overcome that, but that's that's my big worry. I mean, does that does that hold any water with you? Yeah, especially right now when they have a commander in chief that people are questioning. Yeah. Um, and not not to get political, but we hear it all the time: is you're 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 swearing in allegiance to follow the orders of those mm -hmm. appointed over you. Um, and you know what happens when the person the officer that's appointed over you is doing something that you don't, um, that you don't believe in. Um, what do you do with that? And then you got the heads of other countries that are 
that are safe that you know that are that are threatening to go nuclear which mm -hmm. which is do is happening today mm -hmm. um is that where they want their son or daughter you mm -hmm. know on the front lines fighting so you know i kind of understand i guess you know why a parent would feel um hesitant to encourage their you know their son or daughter to go forward but you know with the warfare that we have out there today, it doesn't matter where your son or daughter is. Right. Um, they're, they're, it, it, you know, they could be sitting in, I don't know, you know, Chicago, Illinois, and be in as much, much or more danger than they would um, right. sitting on a submarine or a destroyer somewhere. So, right. um, at least on a surface ship or on an aircraft somewhere, at least they got. They got weapons that they can protect protect themselves with. That's kind of how I see it. I want to close with this because uh, we're we're about a, almost an hour here, which is I could go for hours on with you, Terry. But I want to one of the observations is I've had the opportunity to go out to carriers and and uh, and and ride out with uh, twenty civilians who really didn't know anything about the Navy, and um, and they were going to get the tour and stuff. But one of the things I wish the Navy would do is take people like me, retired people. And distribute them onto these ships when they have guests coming on board, and remind them of what the, they should be looking at. You know, it's it's not you know the, the ships are so awe inspiring, but when they walk down from the flight deck on a carrier, for example, down to the O3 level, which is one level below the flight deck, and their eyes are they're like kids at Christmas. They're they're just their eyes are huge, but they're missing the real the they're missing the most important thing. They're missing that young man or woman who is saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, shoulders back, eye contact made, you know, uh, they, you know, I said, and so if you can forewarn them, say, here's what you need to look for when you're on, this is, this is the difference maker here, right? Then, you know, it helps, right? But send them out for just a tour is not gonna bring, because they're just gonna go, yeah, I had the best time, I got to watch F-14 take off, F-35, F blah, 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 blah. But very few will talk about the sailors unless you tell them to talk to the sailors. And then they find out, wow, you know, they ask the same questions that you and I were talking about. You know, you and I almost had an opportunity to do this. I, I, I backed out at the last minute, which I'll always regret, by the way. But, but there is an opportunity here for retired people to step up and, and, and offer to help. I, 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 uh, I, I talked to a lot of parents about uh, their kids as they're getting ready to to join and, and we have a conversation right about that oath and i pull that preamble that constitution out and, and hit the we the people part and you know and you know you know en enhancing our, our our lifestyle for ourselves and our posterity all of that stuff's important right uh and uh and you're doing such great work in this area i that i don't know how many terry chances we have in the world but but uh i mean here, ladies and gentlemen here's a guy who uh, never stops i mean you know, it's, it's sort of like changing the fire to be a part of the hour around the racetrack. The only time he stops is to get a, a, a body part repaired or 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 his brain refreshed and, and, and ready to go again. So, and, and yet here he is, 38 years serving this great nation of ours. Uh, I'm going to ask if you have any kind of final words that you want to put out, Terry. I'm going to ask you to come back for the GWP. So I think you'd bring tremendous credibility, and we'd have fun doing that. Uh, but what, what, do you have any closing comments, closing thoughts? No, it's not really. It's just you know, just um, keep keep doing what you're doing. You know, I'm I'm enjoying your your podcasts. I listen to them all the time. And um, if if you want to come join us on any of our our workshops that we're doing, we are starting starting them back up again. Um, they're, they're called. Um, we're not calling them uh, workshops anymore. We're calling them something else, but I forgot what we're calling them. But That's all right. um, you know, we are we are we are concerned again about mental mental health. That is kind of where we're really um, trying to focus all of our work. That in suicides, um, our suicide numbers are starting to creep back up again after after the COVID stuff again. So we are working in that area. So. Um, right, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna end the call, but I want you to stay online because I have a couple of things I want to talk to you about here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Terry Chauncey, uh, patriot for sure, warrior, no doubt. And uh, you know, I I use the words hard charger a lot, but uh, here's the premier guy right here. And I love you and uh, and your family and uh, so much, uh, you know, so much respect for you. And 
And, and thanks for coming on today. All right, thanks, boss. All right, so hang on for a second. I got to figure out if I can figure out how to turn this thing off here.